Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 278 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Polygamy is not a practice that often comes to mind when many of us think about early America. But it turns out that polygamy was a ubiquitous practice among many different groups of early Americans who lived in the 17th and 18th centuries. Sarah Pearsall, a university teaching officer, fellow, and historian at the University of Cambridge, joins us to discuss the surprising history of polygamy in North America with details from her book, Polygamy, an Early American History. Now, during our conversation, Sarah reveals how and why many Native American and West African peoples practiced polygamy, the ways in which polygamy offered practitioners economic, social, and political power, and how and why monogamy became so powerfully embedded in the early United States. But first, are you a member of the Ben Franklin's World Listener Community on Facebook? We have a lot happening in the listener community right now. Between interesting posts and conversations with listeners like yourself, and weekly live conversations on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern with our book club. Plus, anyone who wants to join those live weekly conversations is more than welcome. Holly and I often use the book club book as just a starting point for a larger conversation about early American history. Now, joining the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook is free and easy. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. Okay, are you ready to investigate the surprising history of polygamy in early North America? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is a university teaching officer, fellow, and historian of early America and the Atlantic world at the University of Cambridge. She studies colonial and revolutionary North America, and her research probes the intersections of gender, households, and sexuality with politics and colonialism. She's authored two books on these subjects, Atlantic Families, Lives and Letters in the Later 18th Century, and, most recently, Polygamy, an Early American History. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Sarah Pearsall. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be here. So I think it's safe to say that Polygamy is not really a subject that first comes to our minds when we think about early America. But as Sarah revealed in her new book, Polygamy and Early American History, polygamy was a form of marriage practiced in early America. So Sarah, could we begin with having you tell us a bit about how you came to study polygamy in early North America and about just how widespread the practice of plural marriage was? I'd be delighted to. I started thinking about polygamy back in about 2004 at a period when same-sex marriage debates were at the center of politics. And I also kept seeing controversies over marriage in both my research and my teaching. In the course of researching my first book on Anglo-Atlantic families, I started to notice a negative image of a kind of bad marriage, which was the harem which was supposedly ruled only by lust and greed and fear and not by love. And I also kept seeing references to plural marriages in an undergraduate course I was teaching on early American travel narratives. And I started to wonder why so many people in the early modern period cared about polygamy and what it meant. And I couldn't find a lot of discussion about it. But it seemed to me a good way to sort of open up these issues around marriage, power, and society. And partly what I came to realize was that polygamy, in fact, was ubiquitous in early America, that very many Native American groups practiced it, that African Americans practiced it, that some Protestants endorsed it, and that it was central to a number of moments of importance in early America. It's really interesting to hear you say that polygamy was a ubiquitous practice in North America, because there really just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of literature on this topic. 
Do you know why historians of early America have not really looked into or perhaps been reluctant to look into the history of polygamy? Well, there are obviously a few exceptions, but nobody has written a book like this one. Most of the books on polygamy in the early modern era are about the theories of polygamy, largely in Europe. And of course, there's a lot of on the polygamy controversies involving the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 19th century. But I think it's flown a little bit under the radar screen because it sometimes seems to people like a sort of background for drama, as in the Pueblo Revolt in 1680, in things like King Philip's War in New England. But it's there. And once you start noticing it, you realize that it's really everywhere. And partly, I think it's a function of less interest in the sort of intimate politics of the household. And I think it's also still an issue that it retains the power to discomfit people. I think it seems strange and a little bit hard to know what to do with it. And to me, that sense of alienation was what made it worth studying. Why do we continue to feel this sense of it's somehow being a kind of more backward form of marriage? And I was interested in why that had come to be. Okay, so how does one study polygamy in early North America? You mentioned that the practice of plural marriage was legal in European North America and in the early United States. And when we think about historical research, we often think about written records. So if no one is keeping records of polygamy because it's illegal or perhaps because their cultural tradition doesn't include written record keeping, how do you as a historian track down cases of polygamy in the historical record? I mean, what sources do you have to look at to see polygamy? Yes, it was with difficulty. As you note, plural marriages were always outside of the bounds of Euro-American legal recognition. So that meant I had to look at a lot of non-legal sources. I was not interested in cases of illegal bigamy, which were prosecuted, but in public disputes over plural marriages. And that distinction is important. The bigamy cases are ones where usually the wives did not know about each other. And that seems to me a separate phenomenon from one where the wives, the spouses do all know about each other. And that was what interested me. So I used a wide range of historical texts, missionary accounts, travel journals, reports, baptismal records, printed material. But I also looked at different kinds of sources. I read a lot of scholarship in archaeology. I looked at plaza plans and ceramic motifs. I looked at burial mounds and subfloor pits. I also read a lot of indigenous language dictionaries to try to understand more fully, especially the perspective of indigenous people on the practice of plural marriage. How did archaeology help you with your study of polygamy? Could you tell us more about the archaeological sources that you used and What information those sources revealed to you? Yes. So I used all kinds, and it was a really interesting way into especially the perspective of women who obviously left very many fewer sources in the 17th and 18th century, especially if they were Native American or African American. So one of the things I looked at were discussions of teeth which seem a kind of improbable source for a historian. But partly what teeth taught me was that in situations of limited food, for example, among Native Americans in 17th century New England, women actually gave up food for the greater good. We know this because the teeth of skeletons show that women's teeth were worse and that they had suffered more bouts of malnutrition. While partly that situation reflects the demands of pregnancy and nursing, it also implies women's more limited access to or sacrifice of high nutrition food. And the fact that women suffered more from these privations partly tells us something about what women might have been willing or forced to do 
in difficult circumstances of war and hunger. Now, in polygamy and early American history, Sarah notes that contrary to popular opinion, American polygamy did not actually start with the Mormons. So, Sarah, if we want to understand the early American history of polygamy, when and with whom do we really need to look at to see the start of this marital practice? Well, most Native groups in North America recognize some form of plural marriage, though it was usually limited to an elite few. So it was, in fact, practiced for centuries before the controversies in the 19th century. And in fact, it was practiced in places like the medieval city of Cahokia, which was an imperial center in the sort of 12th to the 14th century. And there are sort of evidence of, you know, multiple wives being buried with a husband from even that early stage. It is generally the case that it was elite men who had more than one wife and that this marital status both demonstrated and augmented their political and economic power. That's a really important point because in part, polygamy and power were already aligned in very significant ways before Europeans arrived. Of course, many early European missionaries wanted most of all to convert these leading men, these leaders of people, the ones most likely to have plural wives. So this meant that polygamy was often at the center of colonial contests from the very beginning. Why was polygamous marriage so integral to some Native peoples in early North America? I mean, how did polygamy help elite Native men exert and show more power? That's a really good question. Partly, it requires a lot of resources to practice it. And in cultures where there's often bride wealth given for wives to marry women, it shows an ability to kind of bring all of those resources to the table. It then enhances the power of men because they're able to establish often diplomatic links with other groups by marrying wives from different areas and different alliances. They're also able to have those wives and children provide them with labor and also provide them with links of various kinds, and this ability to mobilize people is a significant aspect of their power. We have some examples of this. For example, Native American sachem or leader named Uncas, who was in Connecticut in the 1630s. He was a committed and highly strategic polygamist. His first marriage was to the sister of another leader, His next wife was the widow of another, and in part, his ability to sort of consolidate his power depended on his ability to connect these different marriages. These marriages extended his network. They gave him access to tribute, to workers, to trade, and they also strengthened lines of elite kinship. These were all very important as he worked to consolidate his situation. And what did polygamist or plural marriage mean for Native American women? Did they have any say in the fact that they were about to marry a man who had more than one wife? They did have a saying. And one of the interesting sources I used were indigenous language dictionaries, which included sometimes sentences in women's voices. We know that because French is gendered as a language, saying things like, I will not marry a married man. That partly indicates, I think, different aspects. First of all, that women sometimes did have a choice about whether to become part of a plural marriage or not. I think it also tells us that likely secondary wives had less power than senior wives, and that some women may not have wanted to become secondary wives to a senior wife already in the household. Of course, it also suggests that there were negative associations with those positions, and that's really interesting. So I think sometimes women certainly did have a choice. And in fact, when one Native leader in what has sort of becomes New France, 
is preaching to the women about Christianity, he says he is not very well received because he's preaching against polygamy and the women don't like to hear that. So it's an interesting case. There are other moments where women defend polygamy in colonial America. And partly those cases seem so strange to me that they were of interest. You've revealed some of the dynamics at play in plural marriage. There's usually a man who needs or wants power for various reasons. And then you have women who were sort of looking for the same thing out of a polygamous marriage. But when we look at these dynamics on the ground, how did they play out? Like, what is the family structure and what are the power dynamics like inside a native plural marriage? Well, I think they were complicated. I think the more people that are in a household, likely the more complicated those dynamics can get. Sometimes wives lived in separate houses and the husband would visit them in turn. Sometimes they lived in a more communal setting. Of course, there is a great variety. I'm talking about a lot of different Native groups. I'm talking about also African Americans, talking about Mormons later on. And there are a lot of variety within all of those groups and, of course, between those groups. So that's one thing to say. In addition, I think we have to think that sometimes there were benefits to that situation, both for men, but also for women. And it's certainly been a source of contention for scholars of Mormon plural marriage in the 19th century about whether it's possible that plural marriages gave women more space because some women could devote themselves to childcare while other women did other kinds of tasks. And it's possible that this kind of task sharing may have made things a bit easier to manage in some cases. I think it's certainly true that there's often hierarchies involved, that senior wives sometimes had power over more junior wives, but not always in that direction. And of course, some of the language dictionaries suggest complications around younger wives being more beloved or more desired in ways that suggest complications. On the other hand, I think we can also see moments where a husband married sisters, where he moved into their house, and where essentially they were running the household. And I think that's quite a different set of dynamics than some others that we might imagine of kind of submissive wives who have no power in the situation. Now, earlier you mentioned that some of the biggest conflicts between Native Americans and Europeans sometimes involve the practice of polygamy. So could you tell us about a few of these conflicts? Like, could you tell us about the Wale people, their traditions of plural marriage, and how those marriage practices fueled conflict with the Spanish missionaries in New Spain? I certainly can. So the Wale people are in Florida, basically, what is now Florida and Georgia. And this was an area where Franciscan, Spanish Franciscan missionaries were working to convert natives. One of these friars had attempted to get the paramount chief, the Mico Mayor, the sort of chief of chiefs, to give up his multiple wives. And in fact, he was loath to do that, though he had been baptized. And the friars told him that since he was a Christian, he should live as a Christian and not as an infidel. But this leader, who was called Don Juan by the Spanish, did not take kindly to this admonition. And in fact, he and his followers, who, as the Franciscan account says, were faulty as he was in the same libidinous vice of polygamy, did not agree with this. They, in fact, beheaded the friar and they led a revolt against the Franciscan missionaries in the area. They ended up killing five of those missionaries and taking a sixth captive. And it took several years of coercion, burnings, and slavery on the part of Spanish authorities to return even to a troubled equilibrium. 
So it doesn't sound like these conflicts were restricted to just religious reasons for or against plural marriage. It sounds like a lot of conflict arose from political and cultural reasons, too. That's exactly right. Certainly, there is a nub of religious interest. And of course, the missionaries are very keen to stamp out plural marriage as a non-Christian, as an infidel practice. But many Native Americans, even those who convert to Christianity, even those who are baptized, don't see it as purely a spiritual issue. They see it as a critical political, diplomatic, and economic strategy that they cannot give up, even if they want to. And they have wives and children already in place who have to be dealt with. And even sometimes they draw the attention of missionaries to the challenges that will be made by leaving these wives and children without a head of household. And this kind of dynamic characterizes a lot of these early colonial encounters. Just how ubiquitous or ever-present was this encounter and struggle over the culture and politics of polygamous marriage across New Spain? You just told us a bit about the Wale people who lived in Florida. But what about the Pueblo people who live and lived in what we now know as Arizona and New Mexico? Did they experience the same kind of conflict with Spanish missionaries over polygamy? Or were their conflicts between each other completely different? That's a really good question. It's a different kind of conflict, but it's also one in which polygamy is significant. The Pueblo Revolt took place in 1680, following years of tribute and slaving demands from the Spanish, of church repression, of local religion, of drought and depopulation, and a majority of Pueblo Indians who spoke different languages and came from different backgrounds, lived in different towns, launched a coordinated rebellion against the Spanish. It was a very successful rebellion, indeed the most successful in 17th century Spanish America, and it was led by someone named Pope, who had previously been punished for practicing older rituals. In part, he called for people to give up Catholicism, to give up Spanish, and also to give up monogamy. And multiple witnesses say that he told men that they should leave the wives whom they had taken and take others, that they should be able to move on, and that also another witness reported that he promised that an Indian who killed a Spaniard would get sort of as many Indian wives as he had killed number of Spaniards. So if he killed four, he would get four wives. And this kind of claim has often either been not discussed much or has been considered to be a kind of form of nostalgia for the pre-colonial past. But I don't think that's what's happening in that situation. In fact, I think Pope was making very strategic appeals to men who were disfranchised by a difficult situation of economics and tribute and slavery, and that when he is promising them polygamy, he's essentially promising poorer men a prerogative that would usually have been only reserved for the elite. So I think it's a democratizing appeal as much as it is one capitalizing on nostalgia. Now, what happens to these conflicts when we change cultures? Because the Spanish weren't the only people to have Catholic missionaries in North America. The French also sent missionaries to convert Native American peoples in New France. So what was it like for Native peoples who lived in New France and practiced polygamy to interact with the French Catholics of New France? Yes, these are some of the richest sources, in fact, that we have on this kind of encounter. And I looked in great detail at one particular leader named Naki Bistichiu and his plural marriage with three wives. He was one of these leaders who was keen to consolidate an alliance with the French. He worked hard to please and to work with and negotiate with the French. And he also was a Christian who preached Christianity and gave up all of the things that he was supposed to, except 
for polygamy. And as the Jesuit missionaries put it, he kept all of the commandments except that one about having only one wife. And looking in detail at this situation, it partly became clear to me that there were many reasons why it was difficult for him to give up his wives. Partly, some of it may have been his own desires, but I think some of it was also the desires of his wives. One of them converted to Christianity, but the other two did not. And I don't think that they were particularly keen to follow Jesuit teachings in this area. I think there were also other family members involved, their children and also parents and in-laws who also didn't think it was a good idea for him to leave this marriage. And I think that that sort of complicated set of dynamics and sort of understanding how this one leader decided not to give up his wives tells us a very great deal about what mattered most in terms of political leadership among Native people in this area. Now, when we think of events like the Pueblo Revolt in New Spain, We do see moments of Native resistance turning into war and military conflict. Can we see a similar type of military conflict occurring in New France between Native peoples who practice polygamy and the French missionaries and Catholics who disliked and perhaps misunderstood this Native practice? We do not see so many moments as we do in the Spanish setting. And I think that that is quite an interesting point. Partly, I think it is an area of concern, but somehow both the natives and the French are by and large able to negotiate that situation. It's not entirely satisfactory to all the parties, but it doesn't end up in quite such intense conflict as in things like the Pueblo Revolt or the Wally Rebellion. And that, I think, partly tells us something about both what natives in that area are willing to do to establish and maintain alliances, but it also tells us something about what the French are willing to do. The Jesuits are not happy about the refusal of people like Machiavelli's TCU to continue to practice polygamy, but they also don't force him to. And that, I think, is an interesting point. Now, what happens when we look at Native American polygamy in the context of Protestant North America? How did English people respond to Native American polygamy? Well, they also mostly do not condone it. As with Catholics, most Protestants see it as an unacceptable practice for modern Christians. But there is a much greater variety of opinion on the Protestant side than on the Catholic side. And partly this has to do with the non-sacramental nature of marriage for Protestants so that it becomes more of a state-recognized system than a church one. But it also has to do with concerns about Old Testament polygamy. And in part, there is a variety of opinion because the Old Testament has a number of patriarchs like Abraham and Solomon who are blessed, but who are also polygamous. And that issue makes a lot of Protestants who wish to return to Old Testament teachings a little bit nervous. And it also makes some of them more open to the possibility of multiple wives. In fact, a number of leading European theologians, including Martin Luther, argue that in some cases it might be better for men like Henry VIII of England to take a second wife rather than to pursue a divorce and remarry. And Puritan theologians are particularly troubled about Old Testament patriarchs, and a few of them even argue for its legality, of whom The most famous is John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, but who also wrote that it was unbelievable that polygamy was no longer a practice and that he argued polygamy is either marriage or else, as he put it, it is whoredom or adultery. And 
the example of these blessed patriarchs who were loved by God meant that it was no way possible that it was whoredom or adultery, and that therefore it was an acceptable form of marriage for Christians. This willingness to endorse polygamy really marks Protestants out from Catholics. Sarah, in all of your research, did you ever find any cases of European colonists practicing polygamy? It's not so much a practice of colonists. It's a practice of other kinds of people, but it also is something that many people beyond indigenous and other Americans think about polygamy. It appears in a lot of theoretical writings. It appears in the works of ministers. It appears in these various kinds of travel accounts. And there are moments where Protestants endorse or argue publicly for the right to practice polygamy. There's one notable case in Connecticut in 1780 where a man is excommunicated for arguing that polygamy is theologically justified. He's not actually practicing polygamy, but he thinks it is theologically sound to do so. And for that, he is excommunicated from his church and he ends up in a rancorous, many-year-long struggle with the church because he will not back down, and several of his male friends in the town support his case, and they are also excommunicated. So it sounds like polygamy was on the minds of many different early Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries, and that's really just not something that we think about or consider when we think about early America. It's true. It's something where, as I say, once you start noticing it, it just appears in all kinds of places. It appears in Enlightenment theories. It appears in religious discussions. It appears in places where we might not expect it, including, for example, a pamphlet in England justifying rebellion against the king in the 1640s, where it also talks about these Old Testament patriarchs. Puritan ministers in New England give sermons on polygamy. These are not things that we usually expect, but in fact, it's both a thing for people to think with and an aspect that suggests what makes the Europeans different from other people in the world. Now, at the outset of our conversation, you mentioned that polygamy was a practice largely of Native Americans and West African peoples. So, Could you now tell us about the West African traditions of plural marriage and whether Africans brought any of these traditions to North America? Yes, polygamy appears in almost every travel account from West Africa, whether far to the north or much further south. And the common phrase used often in those travel narratives is that most men have as many wives as they can feed or maintain. Travelers also know that political leaders tend to have more wives than anyone else. Africans themselves, like Alato Equiano and Venture Smith, recount their own experience of polygamous leaders, of the fact Venture Smith notes that his own father had three wives, that his mother is one of those three wives, and this sort of ubiquity of polygamy in the West African context is pretty well established. And we know that many of those people came to America by force in the slave trade, and that these ideas about polygamy and its significance continued in American settings. We know that from a variety of different kinds of material, including things like lists of family groupings on slave plantations from accounts saying that masters reward slaves that they consider to be good slaves or brave fellows with more than one wife and with enough resources to be able to feed and maintain multiple wives and children. And that is a significant aspect of the way that we can see certain continuities between the African setting and the American one. Yeah. Could you tell us more about the American setting? Because we are talking about a setting with enslavement, 
which means there were severe restrictions on what Africans and African Americans could do. So how exactly did West Africans continue their practice of plural marriage and adapt it to this new setting of enslavement? It's an interesting situation because it's one in which Although we see the same thing, that is polygamy, from the older African tradition into this newer American setting. In fact, as with Native Americans in the Pueblo Revolt, what we're actually seeing is something quite different. The context in which plural marriages take place in America is radically different from how it had been practiced in West Africa. African plural unions have a long history, but the context in terms of the gender ratio in American settings is starkly different. There is almost always a preponderance of men in places like early 18th century Virginia, which is where I focus my attention. And it was sometimes 150 men to 100 women, and at some points even two men to one woman. This is obviously a situation that does not lend itself to a situation of multiple wives. And of course, slaves are not allowed to marry in English colonies. There is no legal recognition of slave marriage at all. So that means the context is quite distinct. And it also means that when plural unions are practiced in those plantation settings, It means that some men are so high ranking within that system that they're able to take multiple wives while other men, many, many other men, have no wives at all. And that means that these inequalities are rendered more profound than they would have been in the West African setting. You know, We've been talking a lot about how men take multiple wives. Did you ever find any instances where women took more than one husband in an early American context? It's very rare. There are some reports of Haudenosaunee people, but it's only one kind of outlying report that suggests that. It's pretty unlikely, and few sources suggest that it took place. There are some moments where enslaved women are said to have husbands on multiple plantations, but it's difficult to know whether this is polygamy or sort of contracted by choice, or whether this is situations where the woman has been sold away from a husband and has therefore found a new one in a different area. So it's very rare, and it's mostly men with multiple wives. What does that say about gender dynamics in early America, that when we talk about plural marriage in early America, that we're often talking about men taking more than one wife and not women taking more than one husband? Yeah, I think, first of all, it's not a system that is egalitarian. It is a highly inegalitarian system, believe me. It's inegalitarian both for that differential that men frequently take multiple wives, but very rarely the reverse. It's also an egalitarian between men, some of whom have multiple wives and some of whom therefore have none at all. And it's an egalitarian between women, often in the ways that I've suggested that a senior wife may be the most powerful and that secondary wives are subordinate not only to a husband, but also to a senior wife. I think that partly thinking about those rank dynamics is different. It sort of gives us a sense of how both gender and rank come into play in these situations. Speaking of gender and rank, Chris wonders if and in what ways polygamy informed relationships between the enslaved and slaveholders. So did polygamy have any role in the ways that the enslaved slaveholders and their families interacted with each other? Well, certainly polygamy is sometimes held out as a kind of reward for those enslaved men who are considered to be more highly skilled or more kind of higher ranking within communities of the enslaved 
But polygamy is also one of the ways that slaveholders mark the alleged inferiority of enslaved people. And in numerous accounts, polygamy serves as a kind of shorthand for societies that lack law and religion, and that those are situations where a few men are able to exercise capricious power, and that this is a problem that Africans are particularly prone to this form of marriage, that their domestic lives are deeply flawed, and that this kind of discussion helps to justify slavery because it suggests the limits of these households, the fact that these are bad situations, and that Africans, therefore, cannot be trusted. Now, after the American Revolution, Americans began to push the idea that monogamy was essential for the American values of equality, virtue, and republicanism. Sarah, what role did marriage play in the early American Republic? Why was monogamy essential for equality, virtue, and republicanism to exist? Yes, so marriage has a really important role I would say not only in the new United States, but in the colonial America that preceded it. And in part, there are a lot of ideas about polygamy in Enlightenment thinking of various kinds. And it's often surprising to people, people like Montesquieu, people like David Hume and Adam Smith, all wrote about polygamy. They all argued for monogamy as the best way to organize society. And one French track of the mid-18th century, in fact, argued that every man has an essential right to claim marriage, that this was a sacred human right, and that polygamy injures that right. This kind of thinking about rights talk, about virtue, about men being able to trust other men are critical, and they become only more so in the early American Republic. They're particularly important in situations where they're working to change ideas about monogamy and polygamy among Native groups. So there are things like a 1793 essay in newspapers about the state of American Indians that is partly working to sort of end the practice of plural marriage among what they call civilized Native groups. It argues that the institution of marriage is one of the foundation principles of civil society, and that is critical for providing a solid foundation for society in both the increase of population and in what they call the wealth and strength of the community. So it's partly connected with political virtue and equality between especially men. So just like in these cases of polygamous marriage that we looked at earlier, early Americans in the new United States were really using marriage, you know, just monogamy instead of polygamy, as a way to power and to structure society. That's exactly right. And partly polygamy becomes coded in these ways as an inferior, a barbaric, a problematic system. So things like the New York Magazine in the 1790s talks about harems as a problem, talks about the despotism that attends sort of polygamous marriages and why that cannot possibly exist in an enlightened republic like the United States. Citizenship in the new republic depends on virtue, on men being able to be full householders, on their ability to exercise equal rights to marriage, and that if this doesn't happen, is considered to be a problem. Sarah, when you consider all of the research you did for your book, Polygamy in Early American History, why do you think it's important for us to understand the practice of polygamy in early America? Like, how does an understanding of plural marriage and the different ways it was practiced in early America Help us better understand early American history. Well, it seems to me that marriage does a very great deal. And whether you're married or not, you know this. Marriage brings states, religion, communities, and families into the most intimate of realms 
It legitimizes children. It orders and transmits property and inheritance. It also carries responsibilities and privileges. Who can marry whom and how their roles are defined are powerfully foundational in any society. So when we look at different forms of marriage, we're immediately brought both to extraordinary intimate choices, but also the power of state and church and family to shape those intimacies. And we see also what I call the infrastructure of monogamy. That is the way in which monogamy becomes so embedded in American society that few people even reflect upon it. But this is not an accidental or inevitable situation. It is the result of a number of contests over marriage across very many centuries. And indeed, even in 1856, the Republican Party declared in its platform that it sought to prohibit in the territory those twin relics of barbarism, polygamy, and slavery. The fact that this is in the Republican Party platform of 1856 partly shows us how significant polygamy became as a political issue. And this history is a very long history indeed. Now we should move into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, Sarah, what might have happened if polygamy had been legal in Europe? Do you think more colonists would have practiced plural marriage in North America? Well, I think it's certainly possible. And as I noted, a few Protestants did argue for that legal change. And it's interesting to consider these theories and what might have happened had they been taken up. One such thinker was a Methodist minister In England, who floated the idea that English laws should be changed so that a man should consider himself married to any unmarried woman with whom he had carnal relations. And in part, his thinking was informed by his work as a chaplain for a hospital for those suffering from sexually transmitted diseases. He thought that putting this new law into place would end prostitution and seduction. And it would make men take responsibility for their dalliances. It's worth remembering, I think, that European and American horror at polygamy went hand in hand often with ignoring adultery. So it's not that men in particular are not sometimes pursuing alternative relationships. It's just that those are never going to be recognized by the law in the way that polygamous marriages are. What aspect of history or marriage are you researching and writing about now, Sarah? Well, the thing I'm doing most immediately is a short global history of polygamy with a long time frame that I'm working on for part of the very short introduction series with Oxford University Press. Partly, I felt it was so interesting to me to think about polygamy and the controversy surrounding it that I was keen to do so over a broader period and a range of places. I'm also working on a global history of the American Revolution, which deals with some of the issues around the intimate and the domestic, as well as the political and the global. And where's the best place to reach you if we have more questions about polygamy and its history in early America? The best way to contact me is through my Cambridge University History Faculty webpage, which also has my email on it. Sarah Pearsall, thank you for joining us and for sharing what you know about polygamy and the different ways plural marriage was practiced and contested in early America. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, Liz. During the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the young United States conveyed the idea that monogamy was the best mode of marriage for the promotion of American values, values such as virtue, equality, and republicanism. But the fact that monogamy became the marital practice encouraged and promoted by the United States 
wasn't inevitable. It wasn't inevitable because North America had a long history of polygamy. As Sarah just revealed, many Native people across the North American continent practiced polygamy. They practiced polygamy because it offered Indigenous men opportunities to show that they had the wealth and power needed to care for more than one wife and many children. And because polygamy allowed them to forge new kinship ties, which often helped them increase and consolidate their political power and influence. Now, it also seems for some wives that polygamy may have been beneficial, as multiple women had the capacity to share the huge amounts of work that went into running a household, such as cleaning, cooking, farming, and child rearing. Of course, as Sarah also mentioned, polygamy wasn't always good for women. Multiple wives meant multiple personalities and additional hierarchies of power that they had to contend with and navigate. Nor was polygamy always good for men. As Sarah related, polygamy is and was an unequal practice. And we can see some of its inequalities in the ways that West African men and some of their descendants practiced polygamy. In its North American context, keeping more than one wife was a large show of power and preference. Slaveholders might grant an especially brave or hardworking enslaved man the ability to take multiple wives. And in situations where there were often more men than women, taking multiple wives often meant that not all African-American men could marry. Polygamy has a long history in North America. And while it's not always a history that we think about, once we notice it, we can't help but notice its history everywhere. And that's because, as Sarah noted, marriage is a powerful institution. It's an institution that has the power to organize and unify churches, states, and families. which is why marital structures like polygamy can offer us an interesting and intimate window onto the power and politics exercised in early America. Look for more information about Sarah, her book, Polygamy, in Early American History, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, all on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 278. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoyed Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. Or, better yet, become a subscriber to our subscription program at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, Have you ever used or thought about using marriage as a way to get at more information about the past? If so, what do you think marriage can tell you about the people you research and about the dynamics of their families? I'd love to hear what you think. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.